of miracles today, but I mean real miraculous events. This had to be one. This had to be a miraculous thing. And look what he says in verse 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. In other words, drowned them in the Red Sea. And how I bear you, that is the Israelites, on eagle's wings and brought you myself. Now we know they didn't fly. They didn't sprout wings and walked. But I have to think that somehow or other, how I wouldn't have the foggiest idea, but somehow God moved that whole group of people, somehow, speedily, without their even realizing it. It was just a miraculous move. And again, uh, I think during the tribulation, the 144,000 are going to experience that same kind of travel. They're going to be able to go from place to place with utmost speed and not even realize they're doing it. And, and I have to think that something transpired here that hastened their move out of, uh, out of Egypt. All right, now then if you'll come back again to where we just left off. In chapter 12... They were to eat the Passover. Everyone was to have been circumcised, whether they were Jews or whether they were servants or whatever. And they of God's covenant people. Joseph knew that the time was coming when God would take them back up to Palestine. We know that Moses' parents, when they saw that he was a proper child, they knew by faith that God was still in their midst. And so, even now, as Moses and Aaron are preparing to move the children of Israel out of Egypt, where do they know they're going? Palestine, see? And so they take the bones of Joseph with them. Time seems to fly by. And now, here's Les Feldick. Good evening, and we're glad to have you with us again for another look at the book of Genesis. If you remember where we left off the last time we were together, we had just watched Adam partake of the forbidden fruit, knowing that he was up against a choice. And if you remember, we, we emphasized the fact that he was evidently absent when Eve partook. And when he came on the scene, he knew what she had done, and as the New Testament tells us, he was not deceived. In other words, Adam was in a total different state of mind than Eve. Eve was caught in a moment of weakness. And before she even realized what she had done, she had eaten. But along comes Adam now. And he has to deliberate, knowing what she has already done and where it leaves him with regard to her and with regard to the Creator. And he ate, willfully disobeyed that revealed will of God. And he ate. And we mentioned, and I think I emphasized it, and for those of you on television who have been watching this program, we trust you're catching it week by week. And also remembering that as we close our last program, we left you with the fact that when Adam sinned, immediately he died spiritually. Now, I've put the three circles back up on the board as we had several weeks ago, only for illustration purposes. And again, for those who would be super critical, I realize that the soul and the spirit are so closely intertwined that we usually think of both of them as the same, but only for sake of illustration, and as we showed a few weeks ago, the scripture does separate the soul and the spirit as well as the body. And we put the three circles up there just for illustration purposes. That man is a makeup of body, the soul, and the spirit, albeit the soul and spirit are closely related. Then we showed that when Adam ate, immediately, instantaneously, his spirit died and lost fellowship with his creator and the body, you remember, began to die. Now, Adam didn't die until 939 years later. But the moment he ate, the seeds of death entered and he began to die. 
he immediately died spiritually. Then, if you'll remember, we went to John's Gospel, chapter 3, where Jesus said it. And we might want to look at it because the name of the game when it comes to any kind of education is repetition, review. <laughs> I always have to remember a couple of years ago, the academic community was all shook up by a mathematics professor here in Oklahoma, if I remember correctly, it was at uh, Rose Junior College in Oklahoma City, where he had all of a sudden taken average mathematics students and had just raised their testing level significantly so that all of academia across the country was taking notice of it, wondering how in the world he was getting these kids to learn math to the place that they were scoring so much better than the national average. You know what it amounted to? He was constantly reviewing. Instead of teaching a segment of higher mathematics and then for a week leave it and go on to something else, all through the semester he would constantly be going back so that by the time the semester ended, these kids were ready for a test having freshly reviewed what they had learned nine weeks early. And I think that's what has helped me in my Bible classes. A lot of times I will, as you well know, I will apologize for reviewing something. But every time I do, someone will come up after the class and say, well, this is the first time I saw that. And so I'm trying not to apologize for review. So anyway, let's go back and just refresh our memories from last week in John chapter 3. And it's all because of what had happened to Adam. Remember, we've been emphasizing that for the last several weeks, how that Adam was the federal head of the human race, and that it was in Adam that all of us inherited our sin nature. We're not sinners because we have done something wrong. We're not sinners because we have done something that the Bible has said not to do. We're sinners, first and foremost, because we're sons of Adam. Now, being sons of Adam, what are we prone to do? Sin. And this is what the Bible teaches so clearly, and this is what we're going to try and show even more clearly on the blackboard using these circles, which again is a, a format, I guess, that I've had more comment on than anything I've ever taught. People will tell me over and over, let's go back and study those circles. And so this is the reason I keep at it. All right, in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking. And he says in verse 19, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now that's the Adamic nature. That is the very first thing we saw in Adam way back in Genesis chapter 3, that even though they had sowed fig leaves, and even though they thought now they had their nakedness covered, when they heard that the Lord was now back in the garden and ready to spend that time of communication with them in the cool of the day, what did Adam and Eve do? They ran and hid. See? Oh, they didn't want to meet God. And that has never changed. This is human nature to run from God. Now we're going to also see in the next few moments, hopefully, and again for those of you on television, we'll never get all this done in the first 30 minutes, so we trust that even though we do shut it off almost instantaneously, we'll pick it up right away again in our next program. But mankind will always run from God. But God comes right back as Martin Luther used the expression. When I first read it, I, I was almost aghast. And I thought, well, now that's just not a very nice way of putting it. But the more I thought about it, the more apropos it became. When Martin Luther referred to God in his approach to sinful men as the hound of heaven. The hound of heaven. And, I, and like I say, it, it thought, well, what a way to put it. But really, that's exactly the way it is. How does the hound operate? He pursues, and he pursues, and he pursues until he finally has his quarry. And that's exactly the way God pursues the person. He just keeps after him and after him. And then as I read that, I couldn't help but think of Psalms 42, verse 1, 
Keep your hand in John. We're going to wear our Bibles out today. I, I just know we are. Go back to Psalms chapter 42 because it says it so appropriately. And this is exactly as it is. In fact, after I'd used this illustration in one of my classes, a gentleman came up afterwards and he says, you know, Les, that's exactly the way it was with me. He's for 40 some years, he said, I ran from God, I ran from Him. He said, I can see it now looking back. But he said, as soon as I was brought to the Lord, in fact, it took place in our kitchen, around that old kitchen table, I just showed him the scriptures and he believed. And he says, ever since then, he says, I just can't get enough of the Word. He says, it's the last thing I read at night, and it's the first thing I look at in the morning. All right, here's where it is. Psalms 42, verse 1. The hound of heaven has pursued until he finally brings that person to coming into the plan of salvation and believing it. And then what happens? As David puts it so appropriately, as the heart, and I think a heart was sort of like our deer, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Isn't that it? Oh, once we come into this relationship, we just can't get enough of God. But until then, what did we do? We ran. That's human nature. All right, flip back to John's Gospel then and continue on verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Men don't love God naturally. We're going to see in Romans in just a second, they're enemies of God, naturally. All right, but read on. Neither do they come to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth, or believeth, or responds to the truth, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. All right, now let's turn over a little further in our New Testament to Ephesians. And again, we looked at these verses a week ago. But let's look at it again as a review as well as an introduction to our lesson this evening. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and again in verse 5. Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1, and then we'll also jump down to verse 5. Where Paul writes, and always remember Paul writes to the believer. He always writes to the believer. And then the unbeliever has to, of course, be approached by simply the Spirit of God dealing with him. But he writes to us, the believer, and he says, And you, hath he quickened or made alive? Now, that's a past tense experience, see? He writes to a believer that in some time in the past, he was made alive. We were made alive, who were, again, past tense verb, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, some of you I know were in a class one time, some time ago, when I asked the question, how much faith can a dead man have? None. How much can a dead man do spiritually? Nothing. All right. Now come down to verse 5, and, and it's emphasized again. Even when we were dead in sins, He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Now, getting back to our circles, and while I go to the board, you can be dropping back to Matthew, if you will. And let's go back to Matthew 16. Now, the plan of salvation is so simple, of course, that a child can comprehend it. But on the other hand, as I've said before, it is so complex, it is so deep, that none of us will ever really comprehend all that God accomplishes when He grants us His salvation. But here's what I want to start out with first. Adam now, as the head of the federal race, has left the condition of every child born into the human race beginning with his own first children, Cain and Abel, were in this spiritual situation. They were functioning bodily, physically, A-OK. -okay. The seeds of death are within them. They're going to die someday, but the body is alive and well. Within the body, they have a soul, 
They haven't lost that like they lost, you might say, the spirit part of them. But again, for sake of illustration only, this soul immediately, instantaneously, as the spirit died, the soul or the very personality became a sin nature. A sin nature. Now again, I should have uh, pointed out when we were there in Ephesians, where in the next verse, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says that we do these things that are contrary to God, how? Naturally. And uh, maybe we should look at it. I told you we're going to wear these books out today, but uh, go back to Ephesians. Keep your hand here in Matthew. We'll come back. But in that next verse in Ephesians 2, it says it so plainly, what I'm trying to bring across, that now, as sons of Adam, we are spiritually dead, and as a spiritually dead person, this is how we operated. This is exactly how lost people around us are living. Someone has made the expression, the world is full of walking dead people. Spiritually dead. All right, look at verse 2. He says, Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? That's Satan. See? He's the god of this world. And when we're without Christ, he is the one who is in control of our life. All right? And so we walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, that is the spirit of Satan, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who are they? Every child of Adam that has not experienced salvation. All right, now then, let's go back to Matthew. The thing that is hard to, to comprehend is that if we as individuals are what the Bible says we are, and we'll be looking also in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, by virtue of being sons of Adam, here's where we begin. We're nothing more than a body with a sin nature, and we've got nothing going within us that would make us want to approach God. Now, when people become religious, that is something that is pressed upon them by society, by parents, or whatever. Our inhibitions are put in place, and it's fortunate that they are, or society would never operate. But that is not what is required to get right with God. Now, when I can help people see this, then they can begin to understand a little more of that... Well, it was almost made less than what it should be during President Carter's administration when he used the expression, you all remember it, that he was a born-again Christian. What did that do to the term born again? Oh, the world just picked it up and Chrysler Corporation spoke of being born again and defunct professional teams who finally got back on top. Oh, they had a born-again experience. That's not what the Bible was talking about. And so now, rather than using that particular term, born again, I prefer to use what it should have been even in our scriptures in the first place, and that is born from above. What did God do? All right, here we are now again. Body with nothing that a sin nature and no concept of God, no communication with God. How, if we're spiritually dead, do we become capable of believing anything. Now, I always maintain that the first step of faith, and you remember what faith is, taking God at His word. The first step of faith is believing that the Bible says, I'm a sinner. That's the first step. And that's the first thing that people rebel at. They say, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. But the Bible says we're sinners. And remember, not because of what we've done, but because we're sons of Adam. All right. So God must do something, and this, I know, can cause controversy in a hurry. In fact, it's been debated by theologians ever since the Reformation, and it's the idea of Calvinism 
as over against Arminianism. Now, a lot of people don't even know what that is, unfortunately. But you see, back in the Reformation, men such as Calvin, and I think Luther, a lot of people won't, probably wouldn't agree with me, but I think Luther was more Calvinistic than most people think. But you see, Calvin came up with this idea that nothing can happen spiritually unless God makes the first move. Then there were those who followed Calvin who took it a step too far, I think, and they became what today we call extreme Calvinists. And they are the folk who maintain that it doesn't make any difference if we preach the word or if we send missionaries. It doesn't make any difference because if a person is going to be saved, God's going to see to it he's saved, so why worry about it? Well, that's not scripture. But on the other hand, the Arminian view who was contemporary, of course, with Calvin, he came up with the idea that Calvin was all wrong, that everything with regard to man's salvation was based on the man's own free will. That if a man decided to become a child of God, he was the one who made the decision. Well, that is certainly not according to Scripture. In fact, I normally don't like to read things, but <clears throat> I just happened to run across last night a statement by a great theologian of a bygone day, he's no longer with us, Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer. And he's quoted so many times on, on various subjects. And if I may, let me just read just one little paragraph. And he says, Within the whole enterprise of winning the loss, there is no factor more vital than the work of the Holy Spirit in which he, the Holy Spirit, convinces or reproves the cosmos world respecting sin righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit does that. The holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the completely unscripturable and untenable Arminian notion of a common grace which asserts that all men at birth are so wrought upon by the Holy Spirit that they are rendered capable of an unhindered response to the gospel invitation has, with the aid of human vanity, so disseminated its misleading errors that little recognition is given to the utter incapacity of the unsaved natural man to respond to the gospel. Now, that's a rather deep way of putting it, but what he's really saying is that none of us, none of us have anything within us that energizes us to approach God for salvation on our own. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. All right, now let's just show you some scripture verses to, to back that very thing up. You're in Matthew now, I think, chapter 16. Matthew 16. And let's come down to verse 13. And here we have the setting of Jesus and the twelve shortly before he'll be going up to Jerusalem to be crucified. He's coming toward the end of his three years of earthly ministry. Verse 13 of Matthew 16, he says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He, Jesus, saith unto them, But whom say you that I am? And as was typical, Peter was the spokesman, and he speaks up. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Period. But you see, that's, that was the question that had to be answered at this particular time. And this is what most Jews could not comprehend. They couldn't believe that he was the Messiah. I mentioned a little quirk last night out of the Jerusalem Post, and I thought it was so amusing, and I, I think uh, the class last night thought so as well. This Jewish rabbi was having a discussion with an evangelical Christian. And the evangelical was speaking of Christ returning very soon. And this Jewish rabbi said, no. He said, uh, he's not going to return, but he's going to come. Well, you see, they don't recognize that he's been here the first time. So he said, no. He said, the Messiah is coming. The evangelical says, oh, no. He's been here before, and he's going to return. And the rabbi responded, well... Let's just wait till he gets here, and then we'll ask him if he's been here before. And you see, th this is the whole idea. 
that they couldn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. But Peter does. All right, now let's read on. And Peter answered, in verse 16, Thou art the Christ. Now verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Now here it is. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but whom? My Father who is in heaven. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit has not come down in a functional role as we know it now today, and so the, the term, the Father, is absolutely appropriate. All right, let's quickly go now to uh, Acts chapter 16, if you will. Now, let's back up John 15. I want to stop at John on the way through. Stop at John chapter 15, and then we'll go to Acts chapter 16, and then I imagine our time is gone. John, chapter 15, drop down to verse 16. If you happen to have a red-letter Bible, it's in red. Jesus is speaking. All got it? John, chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. All right. How did these disciples get to where they were? Jesus chose them. They were chosen. All right. Let's move on now. I just said to Acts chapter 16. Now we come into Paul's ministry. And here we've got Paul in the land of Greece. He has just recently come over after that Macedonian call. And he's in Philippi. And on the particular Sabbath day, he goes out to a little, uh, I think, a riverside park where evidently Jewish people were meeting, since they didn't have a synagogue evidently, but they're meeting out here by the riverside. And then verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. Now, she had a concept of God, but she knew nothing of God's salvation. Now, there's a lot of people like that, you know, even in Scripture. Cornelius was one, and uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was one, and, and we, we see them scattered throughout Scripture where they had a, a knowledge of God, they had a concept of God, but they knew not God. All right? Now then, verse... 14, continuing on, this seller of purple of Thyatira who worshiped God heard us whose heart who opened. The Lord opened. Not Paul. It wasn't Paul's fancy preaching that got to her. But what? The Lord opened her heart. And when she opened her heart, she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul. Who made the first move? God does. All right, one more verse. Let's go to Ephesians again. And instead of Ephesians 2, let's look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And now let's drop down to verse 3. And Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, or in a better translation, He has blessed us in the heavenlies. And now verse 4. According as He, that is God, hath, what's the word? Chosen us in Him. And when did He choose us? Oh, this is mind-boggling. I know it is. But we have to take it by faith. The Word says it. When were we chosen? Before the world was ever created. Now, I hate to leave. I told the television audience when we began, I'd probably have to leave them hanging by a string, and they're going to have to wait a week. But nevertheless, we're going to pick it up right here the next time we get together. And I'm, I hate to say it, but our time is gone. We'll see you next week. Okay, it's good to have you with us again, and those of you watching on television, we trust that if you're back after being with us last week, that you'll remember we just had to almost cut it off a little too quickly, how that we were chosen in Christ before 
the foundation of the world. All right, let's pursue that, because we don't like to give people the idea, well, you know, I haven't got a thing to do with it. Oh, yes, we do. Now, if you'll turn with me to pick that theme up to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. And let's just drop right into verse 2. Now, remember what we were talking about last week, how that Jesus told the twelve, he says, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. When he asked Peter the basis of his faith, he, Peter responded, thou art the Christ. And what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood didn't tell you that, but only the Father which is in heaven. And then if you remember, we looked at the uh, seller of purple, Lydia, in the book of Acts. And again, it was the Lord who opened her heart and attended to the things that Paul spoke. All right, now how does this work? I think 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, probably throws as much light on this whole idea of election and being chosen as, as any other portion of Scripture. Verse 2, where Peter writes, elect. And remember the elect of Scripture, whether it's back in Genesis, the Old Testament, whether it's during Christ's ministry, during church age, or the elect of the tribulation, the elect are always the believer. They're the believers. All right, so Peter is, is talking about believers, elect, according to the, what's the word? Foreknowledge of God. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, unto obedience in the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, now that word foreknowledge then, I think, settles all the controversy. We don't have to sit back and say, well, if someone is going to be saved, they're going to be saved regardless of what I do about it. And on the other hand, we have to realize that in the flesh we can do nothing. God has to precipitate something. And the word foreknowledge, I think, just opens it up for us. Foreknowledge means that before the world was ever created, before Adam was ever created, God knew what you and I would do with the gospel. Now that's mind-boggling. I know it is. But that's the God that the Bible presents. An all-knowing God who knows the end from the beginning, not of just the big picture, but of every individual. Of, of every nation and every empire. Now, I can probably be a little more at ease with that whole Middle Eastern situation than a lot of people because I look at it, the sovereign God is in complete control. Nothing is going to happen over there that isn't within His particular program. All right, foreknowledge. Now, what does it mean? Well, I, I hope I'm not stretching the point but you know, Jesus gave, I don't know whether it was a parable, but he made the statement about not casting pearls before the swine. You heard that? What was he talking about? Well, there's no use wasting your breath with someone who is absolutely contrary, rebellious, and indifferent to the things of the Word. Now, we have to approach and we have to do our best to present God's plan of salvation to anyone and everyone. But you see, God knows which ones are going to respond. Knowing which ones are going to respond, what can he do? He opens the heart. And now this almost comes full circle. I know it does. But nevertheless, this is the way I think Scripture unfolds the, the beginning step of coming into the plan of salvation. Now, now let me go back to the board then a moment, if I may. Here we are again. A body, a soul with nothing going for us but a sin nature. The spirit is dead. And as I said in the last half hour, dead people can't even believe anything. So the first thing that has to happen as the Word, of course, continues to go out amongst the human race, God the Holy Spirit somehow lights a spark within an individual. And it may take a period of time before that individual finally comes to the place of really believing. 
Others, it may not take as long. But the Holy Spirit has to somehow precipitate an activity within the heart, the soul of the individual. Now turn back with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, I don't know if the Lord will tarry long enough, and I don't know whether we'll be staying on the air long enough to ever get to the book of Romans, but if we were to teach the book of Romans verse by verse, as we've started back in Genesis, I would point out in chapter 7 that there is no mention of the Holy Spirit whatsoever. Paul is almost bereft with all kinds of, of thoughts. Why is it that the thing I don't want to do is what I do? And why is it that the things that I want to do, I don't do? And aren't we all in the same boat many times? But you see, the Holy Spirit is in, never mentioned in chapter 7. And then all of a sudden you turn over into chapter 8, and remember there were no breaks in Paul's letters. You get into chapter 8, and what's it filled with? The Holy Spirit. Nineteen times, if I'm not mistaken. Nineteen times the Holy Spirit is referred to in Romans chapter 8. And only once before in the previous seven chapters, and that's in Romans chapter 5, where the Holy Spirit is mentioned only once. Now that should make us sit up and take attention. All right? Romans chapter 8. So let's begin with verse 5. For they who are after the flesh, this person right up here, with nothing more than body and soul, and he's dead spiritually, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's what Jesus meant when he said they don't seek the light. They've got no concern about it. All right? But they who are after the Spirit, you see that's capitalized. So now the Holy Spirit has come into the picture. And the Holy Spirit has done something to make us pay attention to what God has to say. But they that are after the Spirit do mind, again using the verb, the things of the Spirit. Now come down to verse 7. Because the carnal, the natural, the unsaved mind, this one right up here on the board now, the unsaved mind is death. But to be, no, I'm sorry, I'm in verse 6, but verse 7. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity, you know what that word means? Just what it says. He's an enemy of God. He's no friend of God, but he's an enemy of God. And that carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Now that's strong language, isn't it? You know, and every time I, I read that verse, I have to be amazed that the world behaves as well as they do. It's a wonder that they behave as well as they do. And, and we know that, that it's almost coming apart at the seams anymore, but, but still, there is no concern for the things of God amongst the carnal mind. All right, so then verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh, they who are in this state up here until the Holy Spirit moves in, they cannot please God. All right, then in verse 9, Paul draws the difference, though, between the believer and the carnal or the unbeliever. And he says, but you are not in the flesh. You're not under the control of old Adam anymore. If so be that the Spirit of God, what's the word? Dwell where? In you. All right, so the Holy Spirit has to begin a work within the very heart, within the very center of the human being. And the first thing, as I said a moment ago, that the Holy Spirit convinces us of is, now if you'll turn back in your Bible to Romans chapter 3, the first thing that the Holy Spirit reminds us of and makes us aware of is that we're sinners. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 where he writes for all, everybody, anyone ever born into the human race, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that's the first step of faith. This is what God says about me. I'm not as good as I think I am. I can in no way 
please God with my works because I'm a sinner. All right, when we believe that, now the doors begin to open up and our, our mind and our whole makeup begins to realize God is doing something with me. I realize that I'm a sinner. I'm a son of Adam and there's nothing I can do. Now, again, this is why I like to keep my circles up here. We have to constantly remember that when man was created by God in the first place, the body is the only part of us that is tangible and that is visible. The rest is all what? Invisible. Now, something that is invisible and yet is a viable entity, something that we know it's there. The scripture uses the illustration of the wind. You can't see the wind, but is it there? Yes, because you can see the effects of it. You can feel the effects of it. It's there. All right, now it's the same way with, with our spiritual makeup. Now I say spiritual because it's that invisible part of us, that soul and that spirit. They were invisible. They are all a result of the creative act of God. Now then, if we're going to deal with the invisible part of our being, doesn't it follow that there is nothing man can do to correct something that's wrong in the invisible? I mean, we can't. We can't lay it on an operating table and perform surgery on it. We can't feed it a dose of, of some miracle drug. We're dealing with the invisible. And this is what people have to understand, that we're in that area of a man's makeup that only God can do anything with. He alone. All right. So what does he do? He promptly shows us that we're sinners. Now, when we understand that, and the Holy Spirit begins to move us to this place of believing the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. Maybe we should look at it a moment. Keep your hand in Romans chapter 3. Come back with me again to 1 Corinthians 15. We looked at it several weeks ago, but I'm sure even the best of us would have forgotten by now what those verses said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll drop down to verse 1, and here's the gospel. I've told my classes over the years, I wish I could just force myself to use these verses at least every week. But I don't because we get too covered up with all the other things. But here is where it all has to center, the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Not a gospel, the gospel. What does that indicate? It's singular. There's only one. I give unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which, the gospel, by which you are saved if you keep in memory. In other words, if you understand, and that's why I teach. Now, I don't maintain that someone has to know the Bible from cover to cover to be saved. But on the other hand, we have to know what we believe. Salvation is not just something that's glib. We have to know what the book says. We have to know what God is requiring of us. All right? And so he says, if you keep in memory or you know and you understand what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain, and then here it comes in verse 3 and 4. And what does it say? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. It was foretold in the Old Testament. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to what? The Scriptures, the Old Testament. That's the gospel. All right, now flip back to Romans, if you will. Now, when we begin to comprehend the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, and again, according to the foreknowledge of God, this is all part of his plan of bringing the human race into the picture. He knew that Adam would sin. He knew that man would need a redeemer. 
He knew there would have to be salvation, and so he programmed the whole thing with that in view. All right, now in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. <clears throat> now remember, this is after the Holy Spirit has begun to work on this part of us that we're going to call the soul and spirit, albeit it's a sin nature. It is spiritually dead until God begins to open up some understanding. And the first thing we realize then as we see the gospel, <clears throat> that Christ died for our sins. Now, what do we do with that? You got Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And again, remember, Paul is writing to the believers. And he says, knowing this. Now, the word knowing, as Paul uses it in the Greek, was epinosis, full knowledge. Paul says, you have a full understanding of this. Of what? That our old man is crucified with him. Now, I've got a question. Who is the old man? That's sin nature. This is the old man of Scripture. This is the old Adam, that nature that we're born with, that one that in Ephesians 2 said, the ones who were by nature disobedient, we were under the control of the sin nature. All right, now Paul is saying that when we believed the gospel, what happened to that old Adam? He was crucified. Crucified. All right, read it again. Knowing this, <clears throat> that our old man, our old Adam, is crucified with him, that is, with Christ, that the body of sin, that is, that old Adam, might be destroyed. Now, the word destroyed does not indicate an annihilation. He's not removed, but he is merely defeated. He is put in a place where we can now control him. But, how does God see him? Oh, now get this if you don't get anything else. When we begin to understand the gospel, that Christ died 2,000 years ago for you and I living now today, God considered this old Adam of us, of ours, you and I. He considers our old Adam. I better put the old up here so we're sure we understand. God sees our old Adam as on the cross. And all this is basic to our salvation. Uh, again, I have to be reminded that so many believers have told me after hearing me teach a while that, that they've enjoyed an assurance of salvation that they never had before. When they began to understand, yeah, this is what's happened to me. All right, that's the assurance. And this is what God wants us to know. That it, it's not just some flippant thing. It's not just some casual thing that we may have done or we may have walked an aisle, and I'm not against that. But see, that doesn't save anybody. But oh, when it's that we get to the place that we know that our old self is on the cross. It's been crucified. Turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, and I think Paul makes it so clear. In Galatians chapter 2, verse I'm sure many of you memorized when you were kids in daily vacation school and whatever. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2. Now that's right after the Corinthians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then Galatians. Verse 20. I, Paul says, am crucified with Christ. But read on. Nevertheless, what? I live. Oh, he wasn't literally put on a cross and crucified. But yet in the mind of God he was. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Paul was living physically when he wrote it. But he'd been crucified. All right. And yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, 
I live by the faith or the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, come back again, if you will, to Romans. Now let's put something on the board. Just as soon as we believe that we're sinners and we know that the gospel is the only remedy and we believe it, then God takes this old sin nature and he considers it crucified. Now, you remember when we were way back in the days of creation, and I do it purposely with the idea of coming to, to lessons like this down the road. Do you remember that I emphasized who was the creator? Who was it? It was Christ. It was the Lord Jesus in his Old Testament personality. He was the creator. He was the creator God. He is the omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing God. And if he'd been anything less than that, then his death would be for nothing. Then he would have died just like the thief on either side. But he was the creator. He was the God of glory. And as such, indeed he could suffer the punishment, the penalty for every human being. And this is what we have to understand. This is what it means to put your faith in the Lord Jesus. You know, I'm afraid that too many people are going to miss glory on cliches. You know, cliches are little handy things that we pick up along the way. Now, they're all right as far as they go, but if we have nothing more than a cliche, I think we're on pretty thin ice. And I'm thinking of one like, oh, I've taken Christ as my personal Savior. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But what do you mean by taking Christ as your personal Savior? That's just a cliche. That's not in Scripture. The Bible doesn't say, take the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and thou shalt be saved. But what does the Bible say? We have to believe the gospel. And when we believe the gospel, we get an understanding that Christ died my death. He took my punishment. And because I am crucified now, and all this takes place, you want to remember, instantaneously, the moment the Spirit opens our heart and we believe, as soon as this old sin nature is considered crucified, Christ begins to live in us, and I call that then the new nature. And it's a divine nature, and it's set right opposite of the old Adamic nature. Now, I said a moment ago, when God considers it crucified, yes, God considers it dead. He's done with. But in actual experience, where is he? Oh, he's still with us. You bet he is. But contrary to him now, set in contradiction to the old nature, we now have a new nature. All right, we got just a couple minutes left. Let's look at that a moment. Uh, go on again to uh, 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. And if you happen to bump into Ephesians again on your way, why, grab on to it. We're going to go there next. In Ephesians, I mean, uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. And drop down to verse 17. Normally, I like to write, uh, start with verse 14. But for sake of time, let's just come on down to verse 17. Where Paul writes, Therefore, if any man or woman or boy or girl, if anyone be in Christ, that person is a what? A new creation. Now, the word creature in the King James, I think, is better translated a new creation. Now, who is the creator of all things? God is. So the moment we believe, God does a work of creation. And what does he do? He creates within us a new nature. See? Therefore, any man that be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Then if you'll drop down to verse 21, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, do you get the flow? Who is doing all the doing? God is. All we do is believe. Now, I said Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And again, our time is gone. And we're probably going to have to just cut it off. For those of you on television, why bear with us and come back next week, if you will, Lord willing. And we'll pick this right up again. Because this is so paramount. Oh, it's nice to know what the Old Testament teaches, and it's nice to know some of the other things throughout Scripture, and it's nice to know prophecy and what's coming on the scene. But listen, that's not going to etern determine our eternal destiny. This does. This is what's going to determine where are you going to spend eternity. And it is so, so basic and so paramount. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. And again, let's drop down for sake of time. Verse 22, where Paul writes, Ephesians 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation or your former lifestyle, your former manner of living, the old man. Now, I told you, who's the old man? The old Adam. All right, we got to put him out to pasture. The old man who is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed or regenerated in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the, now here's the word I wanted, what? The new man. See? That new man, that new divine nature. Put on the new man, which after God is, again, what's the word? Created, an act of God, created in righteousness and true Holiness. Now, those are all things that only God can do. And how do we get it to happen in our own life? When we believe the gospel. Oh, if you just learn to study. Thank you for watching Through the Bible. Okay, let's pick up where we left off again last week. And uh, again, for those of you watching on television, if you're watching us from week to week, we warn you that sometimes we may just have to all of a sudden, because of the clock, cut it off. But we'll pick right up as we are now again this evening. So turn back with me where we quit in Ephesians chapter 4. And we've left this on the board again specifically so that we can make a quick review that uh, when we're born of the son of Adam, we're nothing more than body and soul, and that soul is an old sin nature, and something has to happen in order to get us back into a relationship with God. Now, the thought just came to mind, and I'm going to put it on the board so that I won't forget it. We're going to talk, if we've got time in this half hour, otherwise in the next one, we're going to talk about the Redeemer concept, because after all, to be redeemed means to be what? bought back. Well, if we're bought back, then it means that something was lost somewhere along the line. Well, we'll look at that in a few moments. But for right now, let's go back where we left off. How that as a son of Adam, we recognize that we're sinners. According to Romans 3.23, we've all sinned, we've all come short because we're born of Adam. And now the Holy Spirit has Somehow or other, and it's hard to, to explain it, but somehow or other the Holy Spirit opens our spiritual understanding that we can believe that Christ literally, physically, as well as spiritually, died the death that we deserved. He took our place. We call it substitution. He died in my place. And then as we saw back in Romans chapter 6, he reckons our old Adam now as crucified. That's the only thing you can do to deal with the old Adam is to put him to death. And then Paul can go on and teach throughout the book of Romans that now since the old Adam is dead, we don't have to let him rule and reign in our lives. We reckon him dead. But all right, let's go back to Ephesians 4 and come in again to those verses we looked at last week. Verse 22 that you put off concerning the former manner of living or conversation, the old man, that old Adam, 
Ephesians 4, 22, <clears throat> which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts or desires, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. The new man. Not the old Adam. We're going to do him out of the way. But the new man, which after God, in other words, after God moves in, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a creation, a new created part of us. And it's created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, when that happens, you see, Paul can continue then to instruct us What's going to be part and parcel of the change of our living? Well, we're going to put aside all the things that before were rather commonplace. They're just natural, and we won't take time to read them. You can do that at your leisure. All right, now then, if you will again, come back to Romans chapter 3. Now, you'll notice that a lot of these reference with regard to what God does in salvation come from the book of Romans. And again, the Holy Spirit was so careful in even the alignment of our New Testament books. I'm afraid a lot of people don't, don't realize that because, you see, the book of Romans was actually written after Galatians and after First and Second Thessalonians. And yet, when the church leaders of, what one was it, in the 300 and somethings, came together and put our New Testament together, the Holy Spirit was, was so evident that he puts the book of Romans right after the book of Acts instead of Thessalonians or Galatians or one of his other earlier letters. And there's a reason for it. It's because the book of Romans is so basic in these salvation teachings. And so we come out of the book of Acts and here we hit this book of Romans. And all the foundation is laid in this letter. And then as we, of course, have been doing, we put all the pieces together from our other epistles. All right, back to Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Let's drop down verse 21. But now, well, maybe we should go back up to verse 20. Therefore, Paul writes, by the deeds of the law, now, when we see the word law, what's the first thing you normally think of? Well, the Ten Commandments. The law, per se, of course, was that whole concept of the law of Moses. It was the ri ritual, their worship, their sacrifices. It was the Ten Commandments, the moral law, but it was also the civil law, how neighbor would deal with neighbor and so forth. But here, when Paul refers to the law, he's talking about the moral law, the Ten, all right? Verse 20 again. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, the keeping of the Ten Commandments, there shall, how much? No flesh be justified in his sight. Why? Because the law only has one purpose in Scripture, and it is what? For by the law is the knowledge, not of God, but of what? Sin. See? Now, when God gave the Ten Commandments then, the Ten Commandments just literally showed the old Adam how he really operated. And that was all the law could do. All the law could do was show man that he was bent to take God's name in vain. He is bent to worship idols. He is just naturally bent to be envious. He is naturally bent to want to thieve. He is bent to all these things that the law prohibits. And so that's all the law was intended to do, was to show man his sin. All right, now then, if you will, come down to verse 21. But now, what's the now? Well, we're not under the law of Moses. Put your hand here in chapter 3, come over to verse chapter 6. Because there are so many folk that don't understand the difference between law and grace. And there's all the difference in the world. Because the Bible delineates it. All right, and here we come now then in uh, Romans chapter 6, dropping down to verse 14. And what does he say? <clears throat> 
for sin. The old Adam now, that old nature, shall not have dominion over you. He isn't going to rule you anymore. He's dead. For you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. See the difference? And then he comes right back and repeats the statement in verse 15. Then he says, what then? Shall we sin? Shall we go ahead and do as we please? Because we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Oh, don't think such a thing. Grace doesn't give us license. But on the other hand, we're not under that demand of the law. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's a thing of the past. All right, now then come back to chapter 3. And again at verse 21. But now, since we're no longer under the law, under the old mosaic system, but now the righteousness of God without the law. Oh, people rebel at that. Oh, I don't know how many people have said, yeah, but I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. Oh, but listen, God isn't demanding that we keep the Ten Commandments per se. We have to recognize that now it's a whole different set of circumstances. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested or is put in the spotlight, if you please, with being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, nothing flies in the face of that which has gone before. It all fits in its proper uh, unfolding of the word. And then you come to verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is not by law-keeping, not by being religious, but how? By the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that what? Believe. See the difference? To them that believe. For there is no difference. And why isn't there any difference? Because we've all sinned. The law-keeping Jew was a sinner. The unlaw-keeping Gentile were sinners. And so we have to recognize that it's only by faith in the gospel that we get to the place that we believe that Christ did indeed die for our sins and rose from the dead. All right, now I want to come back to verse 22 in light of when we go back to Genesis, and we are. Don't think for a minute we've forgotten about Genesis. But when we get back to Genesis and we talk about Adam being covered by the skins of those animals that were no doubt sacrificed, we're going to see that it's fulfilled right here in this verse that we are clothed not with animal hides, but with what? The righteousness of God. In other words, again, coming back to our diagram. Just as soon as the old nature is crucified with Christ, he's put to death, he's defeated, and God puts opposite him a new nature. And he literally clothes us now with the righteousness of Christ so that when God looks on us as a believer tonight, when God looks at you and God looks at me, he doesn't really see me. He doesn't really see you. Who does he see? He sees Christ. And that's what it means to be in Christ. We are just literally clothed with him. And this is what God sees. I'm glad God doesn't see me. I'm not worth looking at from that point of view. But he doesn't see me. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now you're in chapter 3. Go back with me again, if you will, to chapter 6. I hope I'm not confusing the issue, but anyway, now if you come back to chapter 6, now you'll find that after verse 6 that we looked at some time ago, that our old man is crucified with him. He's been put to death. Now then, verse 7. He that is dead is freed from the old Adam. There's only one way we can get rid of old Adam. He is going to constantly be a sin nature 
until we reckon him crucified. All right, now he's dead. Now, if he is dead, what can happen to the rest of us? It can take over. The new nature comes in. Now the Holy Spirit is going to take residence with our spirit, is the way Paul puts it. Now we've got this whole set of circumstances from God's side now beginning to put its influence on the body. And what's it going to do to our life? Totally change it. It's going to totally change it. And as Paul says, the things we once loved, we now hate. And the things we once almost hated, now we love. It's, it's a whole new ball game, if I may use that expression. All right, but now let's go on. Now to verse 8. Now, if we be dead, in other words, the old sin nature has been put to death, and we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also, what's the next word? Live with him. All right. Uh -huh. I can cut this, I hope. Uh, what has happened? We have been crucified with Christ. We have died with him. But now let's go one step further. I probably haven't got that straight. But anyway, uh, when they took Christ from the cross, what did they do with him? Where was he placed? In the sepulcher, in the grave. He was buried. Then after the third day and the third night, what happened? He rose from the dead. Now, we got to carry this identification all the way through. If we were with Christ on the cross and he died my death, then when they put the body in the grave and he was buried, who else was in the grave? You and I, see? Okay, here we are. We also are in the grave. But Christ didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. And now, since he rose from the dead, what can he impart to us? New life. All right, let's follow this concept, if you will, to, uh, to, uh, come over here. They can cut it. That's one thing about taping. We hope they can. Now, if you'll come over to John's Gospel, I think is where I was going to go. Go to John's Gospel. Chapter... Twelve. John's Gospel, chapter twelve. Drop down to verse twenty. John's Gospel, chapter twenty. And remember, get the setting. We're in Christ's earthly ministry, but we're getting right close now to the crucifixion. It's probably just a matter of days away. And there was a great crowd gathering for the Feast of Passover. And remember, the Jews came from every corner of the Roman Empire to these feast days. And here this massive crowd of Jews have been coming from all over the then known world, the Roman Empire, for the Feast of Passover. And they're meeting there in that temple complex. And no doubt many Jews had Gentile friends who they would bring along. I mean, after all, uh, that was quite a trip to go all the way back to Jerusalem. But whatever the consequences, we get down to verse 20 of chapter 12, we see the account that there were certain Greeks. There were Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Gentiles. All right, verse 21. The same, that is, these Greeks came therefore to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee. In other words, one of the twelve. And these Greeks say to Philip, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, this is interesting, and uh, without some in-depth teaching earlier, you won't comprehend it. But nevertheless, do you remember when the Canaanite woman 
came to Jesus and wanted him to perform the miracle on her daughter, I think it was. And what did the disciples say? Send her away. She's a pest. And Jesus made no comment. And finally, after much begging, he finally condescended to her and he granted her wish. But you see, on first glance he didn't because she was a Gentile. And he told her in so many words, I am not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you remember she came back and said, oh, but true Lord, but don't the dogs eat the crumbs? She says, can't I at least have a crumb? All right, now you got basically the same thing here. These Gentiles tell Philip, we would see Jesus. But Philip remembers all these things that have been taking place. And he says, boy, I don't know now. What am I going to do? And so he goes to Andrew. Verse 22, Philip comes and tells Andrew. What did he tell him? Hey, there's Gentiles that want to see Jesus. And Andrew doesn't want to know, what, doesn't know what to do with it. So it's just like a hot potato. And so Andrew and Philip says, well, let's go in and tell him. So they do. They go in. And I say go in because I think that all this took place out there on the pavement in that great crowd. And Jesus was very likely in one of the other temple buildings. And so now they find Jesus and they say, Lord, there's some Greeks that want to talk to you. All right. Now, here's what I was driving at. Verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What was Jesus referring to? His coming death, burial, and resurrection. And any of you that garden, every time you plant a seed in your garden or a farmer plants his crop, he is rehearsing the whole plan of salvation over and over again. Why? Because, you see, as a seed is put into the ground and it waits for the sunshine and the rain, Unless it's put into the ground, it will never reproduce. You could leave it in the granary, you could leave it in the seed packet, and it'll never reproduce. But as soon as it's buried in the soil, then what happens? New life. All right. Jesus was referring to his coming death, burial, and resurrection. And to these Greeks, these Gentiles, he could not be an object of faith until that had taken place. For the reason is that now in our gospel, this becomes our salvation. The fact that Christ died in my place. I am identified with him. As he was buried, you and I were buried. But we didn't stay in the, in the earth. We didn't stay in the grave. As he rose from the dead, we rose from the dead, and we have new life. Now let's go back again to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I think we can wind this segment of it up, and then our next lesson we'll be able to go back once again to the book of Genesis. But all right, now in Romans chapter 8, following up this, this whole concept now, Verse 10, if Christ be in you, and you can also take other portions, and you're in Christ, the body is dead because of sin, the old Adam. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit, now here's the verse I wanted, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, isn't it all coming together? I hope it is. All of it comes together in this complete 
plan of redemption, and we'll look at that in the next half hour. But let's review it again. The Holy Spirit somehow makes entrance into our thought processes. He convicts us that we're sinners, we're sons of Adam, and that the gospel is the only remedy. All right? Then when we begin to understand that, yes, I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm without fellowship with my Creator, but the gospel is the remedy. All right, then we believe and we identify with the death of Christ, even though it was 2,000 years ago. To the Creator God, what is 2,000 years? A snap of the finger. He is just as aware of us in 1990 as He was in His own time or in the time of Adam. Time means nothing to God, so don't ever get the idea, well, how can a death 2,000 years ago have any effect on me in 1991? I guess it is. All right, so then as he was buried, signifying complete death, then also as he was resurrected, we also are resurrected to that new life. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Now let's continue on in the moment or two we got left here in Romans 8. Verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to live just to enjoy living, to satisfy the flesh. Verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, in other words, all you're concerned about is old Adam, you shall die. That is, spiritually. Not physically, that's going to happen anyway. But if you, through the Spirit, through the work of the Holy Spirit now in our lives, do mortify or put to death the deeds of the old body, the old Adam, you shall live. And then here it comes in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they might be, will hope to be, no, what's the verb? They are. See? And that's what we call taking God's Word. He said it, and we believe it, that when the Spirit of God has worked that work in us, we are the sons of God. Oh, we may not always behave like it. Any of us can fail, and, and, and we can always have our weak moments, but nevertheless, God is faithful. All right, then come down to verse 16, and here's where we're going to kind of wind this up. In verse 16, the Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now look at that verse carefully in the light of our diagram. The Holy Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are no longer a son of old Adam, but as a result of God's plan of salvation, we are now what? We're sons of God. Now, if we're sons of God, look at the next verse. Now, if we're sons of God or we're children, then we're heirs. And not just ordinary heirs, but we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Oh, I hope, I hope you can, you can get a glimpse of, of what so many over the years have been able to see from, from just using these diagrams. How that our salvation is not just something that we glibly say, yeah, I believe it. But oh, that we can just enter into it, experience it and know that the promises of God are ours and we place our whole eternal destiny on them without fear, without any consternation whatsoever. The promises of God. And those promises are steadfast, they're sure, and we don't have to waver. We don't have to doubt. And all oh, this is all I want people to do is to study the Word. Thank you for what. And now, here's Les Feldick. All right, it's good to have you back again. And let's go back to Genesis. We've been out of it now for almost three weeks. And let's go back and pick up where we left off in chapter 3, 
Remember when Adam sinned? And uh, then in verses 14 and 15, we, we have what I call kind of a, a parenthetical statement in here. And we'll just touch on it briefly, and then we'll probably come back to it at a, a later class. But in verse 14 and 15 in Genesis chapter 3, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, in other words, he had tempted and caused Eve to fall, which in turn led to Adam's fall. Since thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then verse 15. This is one of the primary verses of the book of Genesis. And this is the first prophecy, if I may call it that, of the coming of the Redeemer. Now I left the word on the board from last week specifically so we wouldn't miss it that the Redeemer concept is begun right here in chapter 3, verse 15. And what is it? Where God speaking to Satan says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman because she was the one that was tempted first. And now here's the important part. He will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, it, that is the, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, a lot of people just read that verse, and they don't even know what they're reading. But what's it really talking about? All right, God is going to put an enmity between the forces of Satan and all the powers of darkness and the seed of the woman. Now, who is the seed of the woman? Well, well, they've got to take it from Scripture. Turn back, keep your hand in Genesis. Go back again to Galatians. As I've said so often to my classes, what I say doesn't really hold that much water. But if we can show that it's what the Word says, and oh, how I want people to learn to just study the Word, not just read it casually, but to study it. And then these things get so exciting. All right, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. And this is what it says. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Promises. And he saith not, and to seeds, which is plural, as of many, but as of one, singular, and to thy seed, who is whom? Christ. See? So according to the Bible, the seed of the woman is Christ. Now, like I said, we're not going to take time for that in this session. We're going to come back to that at a later time. And following the seed of the woman and why the term is used concerning Christ. But looking at verse 15 again, there's going to be a running enmity back in Genesis, back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. There's going to be this running enmity, this battle between the forces of Satan and the Christ. Now, you get a little glimpse of that as you come up through the Old Testament. Everything that God put in place to bring about the coming of the Messiah, Satan did everything to destroy and disrupt. Now, right off the bat, you come into the line of Cain and Abel. Abel is the one who is in the line of the seed of the woman. What does Satan prompt? Cain to murder him. Oh, and I imagine Satan thought he had now already won it. But you see, God in his sovereignty came back with a replacement for Abel in the man Seth. You come on up into Israel's secular history as a nation. And how many times did Satan almost succeed in destroying the nation of Israel? Oh, he came close. But the sovereign God made sure that he didn't succeed in it. And then you come to the birth of Christ. And when those wise men went to Herod asking, where is he that was to be born king of the Jews? What does Herod immediately do? out of jealousy and envy, put out a decree to put to death all the Jew babies under the age of two. 
Well, it wasn't just Herod, but it was the satanic effort again to destroy the seed of the woman. And so be aware of that as you study your Bible, how that the forces of Satan, the powers of Satan, are constantly thwarting the work of God. And, of course, God foretold that it would be that way. And then you go a little further, and he actually foretells the crucifixion. Not as crucifixion, but by the language he's referring to it when he says in verse 315, It, that is, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of Satan, and Satan would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Now, when did all that take place? At the cross. At the cross, Satan was defeated. And there's only one way you can really put a serpent to death, and that is you attack the head. You can cut off his tail, and that's not going to bother him any. You can probably even segment a serpent, and it's not going to stop him but you have to destroy the head. And so this is why that language is used. Christ literally defeated Satan at the cross. He bruised the head of the serpent. But Satan got his licks in by bruising the heel of Christ by causing the suffering. And all that Christ went through there at the cross was the bruising of his Heal. All right, then let's go on into the following verses because I want to come on as quickly to verse 20. But in the intervening verses from 16 on down, we have now the curse brought on the scene. The curse. Now, even, even as we speak, the world is in turmoil over the Middle East. And ho it's been that way for the, the 6,000 years of, of human history. War. Pestilence, catastrophe, enmity between individuals and between nations and between family members. Why? The curse. Sickness and disease. Why? The curse. Everything that is connected with the world's problems, I don't care what it is, all comes back to the curse. You can't escape it. As someone has put it, it's like this. When Adam was created, he was human. But the moment Adam sinned, as we saw in the last few weeks, the human race became inhuman. Now, that's not original with me. I read that somewhere in the past. And you know, the minute I saw it, I thought, isn't that exactly the way it is? Can you think of a single species in all of creation that will torture members of its own species like man will with man? My, when you read of some of the things that man can invent to torture his fellow human beings. Why? Oh, because he's inhuman. He is a sinful creature. And he is so prone to think up things that will hurt the other individual. And it's all because of the curse, because of sin. All right, let's just read them quickly. Verse 16, so unto the woman, that is unto, she hasn't been named yet. That's not going to happen until verse 20. So unto the woman, as we know as Eve, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Do you realize why a woman goes through the birth pains and all the turmoil of delivery? That isn't the way God intended it originally. It's part of the curse. It's all part of the curse. This is what sin brought in. Secondly, you remember way back in, in chapter 2, you may not have taken note of it, but I said when, when God looked at all of creation and he had charged it with all the energy it would need, and I said it was the first law of thermodynamics. You remember that? The first law of thermodynamics, there is nothing being created nor destroyed. All right, now with sin coming in the picture and the curse on the scene, the second law of thermodynamics became operative. And you know what that is? That even though there is nothing being created nor destroyed, yet everything is constantly going into a less usable state. And the best way I can always describe that, say you have a beautiful home. Everything is tip-top. And you decide to leave for a year. 
I mean, you're just simply going to leave town and you're not going to charge someone to watch over your property. You just lock the door and you leave. What's it going to be like 12 months later? Better or worse? Worse. Something is going to happen in that 12 months period. A windstorm will knock off some shingles. A hailstorm may break some windows. Something is always going to make that thing deteriorate. Now, the scientific word, of course, is entropy. Everything is constantly moving into a less usable state. You take a tree. It may have taken a hundred years for nature to, to grow that tree. The sunlight and the rain and the nutrients from the ground all go into that tree. We cut it down and we cut it up and we put it in our fireplace. You burn that tree to the place where there's nothing left but the ashes. In our common everyday way of thinking, that tree is destroyed. No, it isn't. Every part of that tree is still in the universe. The heat that went up the chimney, it's part of the universe. Heat is energy. The ashes that are left is all part of that which came from the sun and the earth to begin with. So that tree was not, as we would think of, as destroyed. It was merely put into what? A less usable state. You take your gasoline. You fill up your car with gasoline, and we think we burn it up. No, we don't. We merely put it into a less usable state. It goes up into the atmosphere as, as heat. It creates energy to move our car down the road, and that's all part and parcel then of that second law of thermodynamics that everything is constantly going into a less usable state. Now that tells us that sooner or later, things are going to run out of steam. But God in His own sovereign grace has so programmed it that we're not going to run out and things are going to fall apart. He has set it so that there will be enough to take it to the end of His program. All right, that's all part of the curse. Let's read on. Verse uh, chapter 3. Verse 17. Now unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened or listened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. This is all a result of the curse. Before Adam sinned, there were no thorns and briars and, and obnoxious insects or whatever. Everything was perfect. But when sin came in, the curse just literally ruined everything. And all of our problems, everything in this world that's a problem, goes back to the curse. And it will never end until the curse is lifted, which, of course, it will be, we think, one day soon at the return of Christ. All right, then verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. In other words, as long as man lives, he's going to have to work for his living. You know, Iris and I have often talked about it. And I wonder how many folks have ever thought about it. What would our economy be like if people didn't have to eat? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of all of the jobs and industries that are all in place simply because mankind has to eat? How you can just about lay awake at night for four hours some night and, and be thinking of all the things that are connected with our having to eat. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. But here it started. Oh, man wouldn't have had to have all that, but yet it had to come about. And so our whole economy is structured on the fact that man has to work and man has to eat, all right, until he goes back to the dust from which he came. For God says, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Now then, verse 20 is an interesting verse. But again, I'm afraid too many people don't stop to just think of what it says. 
I don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden. I've read all kinds of conjectures from one or two days to a year or more. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us. I wouldn't have the slightest idea. But however long they were in the garden, Adam never had a name for his wife. She was just called the woman. But now, you see, after sin entered and after the curse has come down, Adam calls his wife's name Eve. And if you've got a marginal help, what does it say? The mother of all living. Now, all Adam has been told from our scriptural account is that in the day he would eat that tree, of that tree, he would die. But now Adam comes back after they're ready to be out of the garden, if they aren't out already, and he names his wife Eve, which meant the mother of all living. Now, what does Adam understand? That even though he has sinned, he has lost fellowship with God, God must have told him something that he believed. And what is it? That he's going to live, he's going to have children, and the whole human race is going to come from him and his wife Eve. Now, you have to study that, and you have to really think about it to get the whole picture. But is, what's really involved here is God told Adam that this is the way it would be, and what did Adam do? He believed it. See? And here is the first instance now of faith, taking God at his word. By faith, Adam believed what God said concerning him and the woman, and so he names her the mother of all living. All right, now then, Adam's faith prompts God to do something, just like we saw with our circles for the last few weeks, that when the Spirit of God prompted us to believe, then God moved in on our behalf and does everything that needs to be done. He does the same thing back here with Adam. Adam shows that particle of faith that he believed what God said, and God moves in and does what needs to be done. And in verse 21, what is it? Well, remember, Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All right, there had to be a sacrifice. Now, the Old Testament animal sacrifices are merely a, a foretelling, a picture of that supreme sacrifice that was to come in Christ himself. But now God institutes animal sacrifice. Verse 21, unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God. See, now Adam and Eve didn't do this like they did the fig leaves. This God did. God somehow or other killed the animal or animals. The blood was shed. And the language here you have to, again, study Scripture in order to comprehend it, and we're going to look at it in just a moment. But it says, The Lord God made them coats of skins. Now, that covered their, their physical nakedness. But then he did something else. What did he do? He clothed them. Now, let's go look at Isaiah. Isaiah 61. I'm afraid too many people think that when they read verse 21, it just meant, well, he, he gave them skins and how he could make some kind of a, a physical covering. But oh, it's more than that. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, drop down to verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. All got it? All right, now this should tell us something. Where Isaiah writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he, who does he refer to? God. For God hath clothed me with the garments of what? Isn't that beautiful? God has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of of righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. And all he has done it as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. 
That's what God has done for you and I. All right, now let's go back again to Romans chapter 3, where we were last week. Romans chapter 3. We looked at the verse, but I didn't make this point because it wasn't the appropriate time, but now we can. In Romans chapter 3, again, we'll start with verse 21. But 22 is the verse that we want to compare with Isaiah 61. Now remember what he said, Thou hast clothed me with the garments of salvation. All right, now look at Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested or has been brought into the spotlight, center stage, if I may use that expression. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's all been building to bring us to this point in time. And then verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith or the faithfulness again of Jesus Christ. Now look at it. Unto all and up on all that what? Believe. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, the righteousness of God clothes us like the young man decked at his wedding or like the bride decked for her wedding. And the righteousness of God is placed upon us, and as I said before, so that God doesn't see you and I. But what does he see? The righteousness of Christ that covers us. And how do we get that beautiful covering? By believing. Now look at that verse, because I'm going to put something in there that everybody else tries to put in there, and it's not here. And this righteousness comes upon all them that keep the Ten Commandments. It doesn't say that. And this righteousness comes upon all them that repent and are baptized. It doesn't say that. This righteousness comes upon all them that join a church. It doesn't say that. You see what I'm driving at? We have to understand as much what the Bible does not say as what it says. And all these things I've just used is not in there. And we have to leave the word as it is. This righteousness comes how? When we believe. Well, believe what? The gospel. And when we believe the gospel, everything else falls into place. Oh, we can't believe all that things are in Scripture. I mean, while we're in the New Testament, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Turn over just a few pages to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul has been rehearsing all through the first 12 verses of this chapter, how that he wasn't something special. He wasn't some great orator that got their attention. But oh, how did he get to where he is? Verse 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, and then come into verse 14. But the natural man, now that's why I'm always glad I've taught the circles. See, now you should be able to start seeing what we're talking about. Who is that natural man? That only body and soul. The natural man is the one who is spiritually dead. He can't comprehend the things of God. He is spiritually dead. All right, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. So a lot of time, if I have unbelievers come into my class, I'll just simply, without pointing them out, I don't know who is or isn't, but I'll just make a blanket statement. Listen, if you don't know the Lord, you're not going to understand everything that I'm teaching. It's impossible. It's just going to go over your head. But oh, I've had so many people who knew nothing, who knew nothing of the things of God, but as soon as they became a believer, what happened? Oh, they could just see the whole thing. And, and they could question nothing. And, oh, I've had so many 
especially men. I've had men come after class umpteen times and say, you know, it's just like you turned on a 300 watt light bulb tonight. And I know I didn't. That's the Spirit's work. I just show what the Bible says. I think I spend half my time just reading to people. <laughs> and, and they'll see things as I read that they never saw before. Well, that's not me. That's the Spirit's work. And oh, this is what we have to understand. All right, now let's come back quickly then, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. Our time is gone. But uh, Genesis chapter 3. We'll wind it up now so that we'll be ready for chapter 4. See, I'm not going to get to the word Redeemer even this time. We're going to leave it up there for the next time. All right, but in chapter 3, let's finish the chapter. Verse 22, God has now restored Adam and Eve to fellowship by virtue of his faith and the animal sacrifice. And now, he says, Behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever... Do you realize how that leaves you hanging? There's no period there. The, the English has a colon, and the Hebrew has, again, a, a punctuation that just says, now you just try to imagine what it'd be like. And so that's where, where you're left. What if Adam would have been able to partake of the tree of life and live forever in this body of sin? That had been awful, see? All right, then, verse 22 We've got a half a minute left. Verse 22, 23 rather, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He drove out the man and placed on the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned away everyone to keep them from the tree of life. And now we're going to pick it up next week with Adam and Eve out of the garden. It's all over so far as they're concerned in that beautiful setting. And we'll pick it up there next week, Lord willing. S. Feldick. Good evening. It's good to have everybody back with us again. And tonight we're just going to pick right up where we left off last week. And if you'll turn with me then to Genesis chapter 4, we'll begin right with verse 1. Now, just for a little bit of review from our last program, you'll remember that Adam and Eve were brought back into fellowship by virtue of the animals that were slain and God provided the blood sacrifice first and foremost and their clothed, being clothed with the righteousness of God and they were also of course clothed in their physical nakedness by the skins and then since sin had now entered they had to be removed from the Garden of Eden and as we come in then to chapter 4 it's a whole different set of circumstances, remember. Sin has now come into the picture. The necessity for a getting back in a right relationship with God becomes a necessity. They are no longer under the, the light, easy keeping of the garden as they were before. Now they're going to have to go out and make their way by the sweat of the brow. They're going to have to live under the effects of the curse, thorns and thistles, disease insects and all the things that the curse brought in are now part and parcel of Adam and Eve's environment they're going to begin to raise children but remember it is all now under the curse and so as we come into chapter 4 then verse 1 they have been out of the garden we don't know how long the Bible again doesn't tell us specifically but in verse 1 of chapter 4 Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. And bare Cain, the first child born now to this couple, and immediately Eve said, I have gotten a man, and I think it'd be clarified if you would say a man-child. I have gotten a man-child. Now the King James says from the Lord or from Jehovah. Now if you happen to have a, a Bible that's the uh, revised version, I think in the margin they state that this is better translated, I have gotten a man-child with the help of Jehovah. Then there are others, and I prefer the others, who say that this is better translated by reading it this way. Eve said, I have gotten a man-child, even Jehovah. Now think about that for a minute. 
I have gotten a man-child, even Jehovah. Now, that, that has to make us think. Come back now to chapter 3, and we touched on this verse, and when I was teaching it, I said, now, we'll be coming back to it, so I didn't really go into it too much in depth a couple weeks ago. But in chapter 3, verse 15, the Lord God, or Jehovah, is addressing, of course, Satan in verse 14 and 15. But verse 15 is the one we like to look at, where it says, God speaking, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, that is, between Satan and the female of the species, the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, that is, the, the seed of the serpent, shall bruise, uh, I'm sorry, it shall bruise thy head. In other words, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of Satan, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. Now remember we pointed out that this is foretelling then that long run of enmity between the powers of Satan and especially the Son of God who would be coming on the scene as the Redeemer. So there will be a, an enmity between thy seed and her seed. It, that is the seed of the woman, shall bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent would get his licks in by bruising the heel of the Redeemer. All right, now if you'll flip back to Galatians chapter 3. We always have to qualify everything with Scripture. And that's the whole idea of studying, that we can compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, the seed of the woman is unique in verse 15 of Genesis 3, but we have to follow it all the way through Scripture because, as I said, it was looking forward to the coming of a Redeemer. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, then, verse 16, it, it's certainly qualified as to who is the seed of the woman. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So we can always scripturally refer to the Lord Jesus, then, as the seed of the woman. Now, you remember when we first started, way, way back in Genesis 1 and uh, at creation, and then as we came into Adam and Eve eating of the forbidden truth. You remember I, I, I made a point, at least I certainly tried to, that first and foremost we have to understand that Adam, as he was first created, actually contained the woman as we now know as Eve. At that time she wasn't called Eve, she was just simply called the woman. And so when Eve was then created, the Bible makes it clear that she came out of Adam because Adam had to be the federal head of the human race and that everybody, including Eve, would now come from that line of Adam. And that's why the scripture tells us so plainly that the human race didn't come under sin by virtue of Eve, even though she ate first. But sin came on the whole human race by way of Adam. Now, we have to understand that Eve was in Adam because even though God did not put the curse on Eve for having eaten of the tree, yet she inherited that sin nature just like every other woman and every other man since through Adam. Now, all this should begin to tell us something. For some reason or another, and after we understand the whole picture, we begin to see it, but for some reason or other then, God had to keep the fault or whatever you want to call that fell upon man in the curse. He had to keep that from Eve. He insulated her from it. 
And she simply inherited her sin nature, not from the act of her own eating of the tree, because that she did in ignorance, but she was now a fallen creature because she was in Adam. Am I making myself clear? But even though she is a fallen creature, she is under the anathema of sin just as much as Adam or anyone else, yet God had something in the long-range view in order to provide a Redeemer. And that had to come through the woman. Now, if you really stop and think, most of us, I think, that are in my hearing, certainly ascribe to and believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Now, isn't it amazing that Christ could be born of a woman who, out of the line of Adam, was a sinner like anybody else. Mary was not sinless. She was just as much in the line of Adam as anybody else. But isn't it amazing that God could bring to pass the birth of the Christ child from a normal human being of the female species, and yet her offspring would be sinless and not pick up anything of that human element of the sin nature. Now, why? Well, now, here's where things get to the place I know they get a little deep, and I'm afraid the average Christian never even stops to consider it. But that's not why I teach. I teach so that we kind of get down to the, to the basics and the things that are maybe not so easily understood. Because God intends for us to study. He intends for us to grow, and He intends for us to go into the deep things, as Paul calls them. All right, now if Eve was somehow or other insulated from when she ate of the tree, so that all the way down now then in the female of the species, and I have to, I have to emphasize that, it's, it's the female that is somehow or other insulated from the curse that came by way of Adam. Now, I think maybe the, the easiest way I, I can show this is that the, the seed of the woman, which we normally refer to physiologically and, and in medical terms, well, the ovum or the egg in, in other species we refer to it. And, of course, when, when the female of the species begins to get ready for reproduction, within her body there is building all of these potential ovum seeds, if you want to call it that. And those, of course, will never be anything more than just that until they are impregnated from an outside source. Normally, we think of from the Father. All right, now, this is hard for some people to understand, and yet physiologists, and I've got plenty of quotes to prove it, that as soon as the young mother becomes pregnant, one of these ovum has, has come off and it's impregnated. She becomes a mother. Now, the first thing that happens is that these cells, of course, begin to divide and multiply rapidly. Up until we get from 16 to maybe 32 of these cells that have simply divided they have become two, they become four, and they become eight, and so on and so forth. Then at about 32 and maybe sometimes at 64, then all of a sudden in the development of that little embryo, that process of cell division and multiplication stops and the body cells begin to develop. Now, when I say the body cells, I'm talking about the, the extremities, the fingers and the feet and the legs and all that. And all of this is going to form that, that little human body. And then at some point, quite a while down the line, then again, these little reproductive cells find their way into the, the fetus as a whole over here in there. And that's why, remember back, I said that uh, Eve wasn't a rib, but rather she was taken out of the side of Adam. 
and that it was probably the, the reproductive part of Eve, and, we've, and I think that the correct term is the germplasm. And that's all part of, of our reproduction. All right, but now here's the amazing thing. Eve had to be insulated from any part of the curse so that these reproductive cells beginning from Eve all the way down to Mary and probably continuing on to this very day do not carry the curse from one generation to the next except through the Father. It's only the Father that precipitates what we would call the circulatory system or the blood system. Now, oh, you have to think about this for a little bit because this doesn't just, just come easy like 2 plus 2 is 4. Now, if the female of the species has been insulated from the effects of the curse, that is, in the reproduction area, she cannot pass down from her generation to the next the curse of sin. That has to come from the Father. Now, physiologically again, there is none of the mother's blood that ever becomes part and parcel of that little fetus or later that little infant. The blood comes from the Father. Always remember that. All right, now then, the line of the curse comes through the blood, through the Father. And so every human being, as we've been stressing in these early lessons in Genesis, every human being is a born sinner by virtue of the fact he's inherited from the father, not necessarily the mother, although she is just as much a sinner as anybody else. But why has all this happened? Why did God see fit to insulate the seed of the woman from the curse? Well, he was looking down through the, the eons of time to the coming of that Redeemer because Christ had to be born of a woman, but he had to be sinless. Now, since the ovum or since the reproductive cells of the woman did not carry the curse, God, as we know, is what happened at the virgin birth. God was the one who impregnated Mary. And so she became the mother of the Lord Jesus without benefit of a human father. And that's why we call it the virgin birth. Now, you see, the Lord Jesus could be born of the woman without the effects of the curse that came from the human father. And so what was he? He was sinless, he was divine, his blood circulatory system did not originate with the human element, it originated with God. And yet, since he was born of the woman, he was human, he had the same appetites that we have, he lived, he ate, he slept like we do, and yet what? Without sin. All right, so now then, coming back to chapter 4. Verse 1, I never like to use the word assume because we can never do that with Scripture, but I think it is so perfectly implied that since God had now provided the way back to himself by virtue of Adam's faith, that they would continue to live and they would continue to have children, they would be the parents of the human race, he provided that blood sacrifice that was necessary, but faith is always another one of the prerogatives. It has to be faith plus the blood offering. Remember Hebrews? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. It was the same way here. God provided the blood sacrifice, but Adam and Eve had to believe what he said. All right, now if you look at this verse 1 very carefully and stop and analyze what is Eve driving at when she says, I have gotten a man-child, even Jehovah. Well, now what did Genesis 3.15 promise? The seed of the woman who would defeat 
Satan. And we know, of course, from the terminology that it, that took place at the cross. So evidently, now I know this takes some deep thinking, evidently the Lord had shared this much with Adam and Eve that since sin had come into their existence and that sin would be plaguing the human race, he would himself come back on the scene, born of the woman, and become their redeemer. And so Eve had this right front and center in her thinking. And when this little boy baby was born, what did she think? This is already him. He has already kept his word. But you see, she didn't realize that it would be generations down the line before that Redeemer would come. But she had the concept. Now, she had no idea, of course, that he would be crucified on a Roman cross. I'm convinced of that. But she did understand that God was going to provide a Redeemer to bring the human race back to himself. All right? Now let's just look at the Redeemer concept. In fact, we had it on the board, do you remember, uh, last week or the week before. And we've pointed out before that even the book of Job, we won't stop and look at that one now, but come all the way back, if you will, to Romans. In Romans chapter 3, but you remember Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And so this whole concept of redemption is, is all the way through the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Exodus. What do we normally call the book of Exodus? It's the book of redemption. And why do we call Exodus a book of redemption? Because God bought his covenant people out of the slave market of Egypt. He redeemed them. He bought them back. And see, that's the whole concept of redemption, isn't it? It's something that you have lost control over, but you buy that control back. In other words, let's just uh, put it down into everyday vernacular. I guess just about every American knows what a mortgage is. And maybe you were fortunate enough that you had a home that was paid for. And then you became unfortunate and you had to have some cash, put the kids through school, whatever. So what do you do with that home that's been paid for? Well, you go to the bank and you mortgage it. Now, who's really got control over that mortgaged house? Well, your banker does. You can't do anything with that house until you've somehow settled with your banker. But there is a way you can get that banker out of your hair. What do you do? You buy that mortgage back. You pay it off. That's redemption. All right. Romans chapter 3. You found it quicker than I did. Romans chapter 3. And come down to, again, the verses that we looked at before, beginning with verse, well, let's just start with verse 21. Verse 21 again. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith or the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, that is, between Jew now and the Greek. We're in Romans, we're in Paul's uh, doctrines of grace, of course. And then verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then as he says in chapter 5 of Romans, it's because of Adam, by one man, sin entered the world. All right, but now verse 24 being justified freely by His grace through the, what's the word? Redemption, through the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His, what's the word? Blood, see? Remember the two mandatory Statements of Scripture, without the shedding of blood there is no remission, and without faith it is impossible to please God. It takes those two. You can't shortcut them. You can't detour them. You have to face them head on. All right? So here we have it. We are redeemed when we believe what God says about the shed blood, about His death, 
his burial, and his resurrection. All right, now we're not going to have time to, to finish all this. I can see that already. So for those of you who are watching on television, you'll just have to wait till next week, and uh, we'll just pick up right where we leave off. But all right, in verse 24 then, we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right, now we have to look at this system of buying us back. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, who did Adam and Eve really belong to? Well, the Lord. They were his. He enjoyed their fellowship. He enjoyed their company. And they enjoyed his. But you see, when sin entered, and they became a sin creature, now who took over control of Adam and Eve and their surroundings? Well, Satan did. So God lost them. He lost control over them. Satan now had them. But you see, God immediately, in their behalf at least, getting the whole thing started, God immediately came in and did what? Redeemed them by virtue of that animal sacrifice and speaking to them in words that they could understand, and they believed it, and so he redeemed them. He brought them back to himself. Now, that was just the beginning of the redemption process. And so all the way through Scripture... We have this whole idea of redemption. I've already alluded to the book of, of Exodus as the book of redemption. All right, now the same way. The nation of Israel, when God had called out Abraham and promised a, a nation of people that would come from that one man and that it would come through the line of Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons. And God was in, again, full fellowship with that line of people. And then you remember the story, the 11 brothers hated Joseph because he was the favored son. And for all practical purposes, what did they do with him? They killed him so far as they were concerned, albeit God had something else in mind. He spared his life. But Joseph ends up where? Down in Egypt. Now, because Joseph ends up in Egypt and becomes the, the second greatest man in all of Egypt, and he was in control of the, of the grain and getting everything ready for the seven years of famine. When the famine hit Canaan and there was grain down in Egypt, where did the brothers have to go? Down to Egypt. You know the story. All right, now then, as a result of Abraham's offspring, the sons of Jacob, now in Egypt, in that pagan, godless land, what happened to them? Well, they lost their fellowship with Abraham's God, and they became, you might say, mortgaged to the pagan, heathen Egyptians. And there they were. They were in bondage. And so what's God going to have to do? He's going to have to buy them back. He's going to have to redeem them. And so that's the whole story of the book of Exodus. How that God, instituting first and foremost again on the night of the Passover, what? The shedding of the blood of the Passover lamb. The placing of the blood on the doorpost. It had to start with that. But as you move through the account of Israel now coming out of Egypt, after the blood has been applied, then what did they have to do? Well, they had to move out. And God led them through the man Moses. And they come to the shores of the Red Sea. And now there they're trapped. The Red Sea in front of them, populated areas to the left, and mountains impassable to the right, and the Egyptian army coming from the rear. And where are they? Trapped. But what does God do? Oh, He redeems them with His power by opening the Red Sea. And they come through on dry ground. And as a result... They're bought by the power of God, by the Passover blood, out of Egypt and unto God's own self. Now that's the picture of redemption, and we'll have to pick it up as we go into the next program. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. People's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick.
Okay, let's pick up where we left off last week and turn back with me again to Romans chapter 3, and we're going to pick up a little more discussion on that word redemption or redeemer. And before I go any further, I want to encourage our television people to sit down and use your Bible, compare these scriptures along with us, even as we do in our class. I'd also like to let it be known that these programs can be purchased on videotape. We can put 12 programs on one six-hour tape, and we can sell them for $20. Now, that won't give us anything left over, but if you're interested in a video, you write to us, and uh, we'll do all we can to get them to you. All right, if you'll turn with me now then to Romans chapter 3, and again verse 24, where it says, We are justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, there is a way whereby God will purchase back that which he lost back there in the garden. Now you want to remember, and we were talking about it after our last class when we had a question come up, when Adam and Eve were first in the garden, they were gods. And they were in perfect fellowship with him, weren't they? But then sin entered, and that fellowship was broken. And then God lost control of Adam and Eve. They had now come under the control of the God of this world, old Satan. So immediately, God institutes a way whereby he can buy the human race back to himself. And we call that redemption. And as I alluded to last week, remember, it's all the way through the Old Testament. God purchased Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. And that is the beautiful picture of our own salvation. We too, as sons of Adam, were slaves of sin. We're in the slave market of Satan. And God is, is I guess you can say, is his hands are tied because he has given us that free will. Now he'll do everything he can to bring us out of the slave market, but we have to want to. He cannot force us. And see, this is the whole idea again of when we were created, we were created with a mind and a will as well as a set of emotions. And then as we pointed out to the individual that had the question, the whole idea between God and man is when God extends his love to us, what can he rightfully expect? Love in return. But we don't have to. We're free agents. We don't have to do anything, but he's made it all possible. All right, now Paul here in this word redemption, actually as he does so many times in all his letters, will go into a, a physical, literal setting, and he uses a word that was so common in the days of the Roman Empire in the slave market. Now I think if you know anything about ancient history, Slavery was just part and parcel of, of everyday living. And so as these Roman legions would make excursions on up into Europe and wherever they went into their conquering hordes, they would always bring back what? Slaves. And you see, this is what made the Roman Empire so corrupt finally. The actual Roman citizens never had to work. They never got their hands dirty because the slaves that were constantly being brought in did all the manual work and uh, for little or no wages, it was slavery to the utmost. And of course that gave rise then to the softening of the Roman uh, physique and everything else and they finally fell apart. They became uh, victims of then the conquering hordes from, from Gaul. But all right, here come these... And I like to picture, just by virtue of making it a little more interesting, let, let's picture some, some young teenagers that have been taken prisoner, maybe up in France or Germany or even may, uh, all the way up into Scandinavia. And then they bring these back to Rome. And they go into the slave market. Now again, I, I like to just make this a, as visible as I can. And, and here is the slave market. And these people are constantly being brought in. And the end result, of course, is to be made sport of with the lions in the Colosseum. You remember that much of Roman history. 
All right, so for a person coming into the slave market, if someone didn't come along and buy them out, the end was death. There wasn't much to look forward to. All right, let's take, for example, a, a, an attractive, uh, let's take a brother and a sister. Maybe they were both captured at the same time. The Roman legions bring these two teenagers back to Rome. Let, let's say they're, they're just the prime of, of life, 18, 19 year old. And here's this brother and sister. Lovely kids, but they're slaves. They've been captured. And so they're in the slave market with nothing to look forward to but death in the Colosseum. But along comes a benevolent Roman. Well to do. Now in the Roman slave market language, there were three words. And it doesn't hurt to, to remember them. The one was uh, agorazzo. A-G-E-R-O-Z-O. The second one was ex agarazzo. And then the third word was latru. Now those are the Greek words that were constantly in use in that Roman slave market. Now I'm not up on the stock market or any of their language. I know a few of their terms, but they too, they have their own language. You can sell short, you can buy long, and you can take options and put options and all that. Well, they have a language all their own. Well, so did the Roman slave market. All right, now, if they wanted to agorazzo someone who is in this slave market, they could do just sort of like our stock traders do uh, daily in the exchange. They'll buy stock in the morning, and maybe it goes up two, three points in the afternoon. What do they do? They sell it. In other words, they have no intentions of really hanging on to that sale. They're just playing the market. Well, they could do the same thing back in Rome with slaves. They could buy a slave at 8 o'clock in the morning and they could leave it in the market, hoping that maybe later in the day the market would go up and they could resell the slave and take a profit. It was just kind of sport to them. But the next word, ex agarazzo, what does ex mean? Exit means out. Now they also had the prerogative that if this rich Roman would come down to the slave market, he could pay the price of redemption, but he could also say, I'm going to take that slave out of the market. I'm going to take him home with me. All right, let's take our brother and sister now. These two beautiful kids, but they're slaves. They're in the market. And this rich Roman comes and he pays the price, but he takes them out of the market. And he takes them home. But he's a benevolent Roman. Got a big, beautiful villa. And so he takes these two kids and he gives them a, each a beautiful room in his villa. He gives them a whole wardrobe of nice, beautiful clothes. And he gives them maybe just the light labor of taking care of his, of his landscape. And he's, he's just a good master. And he's done everything for these two lovely teenagers. And then one day he comes along and he says, tell you what, kids, I have also gone one step further. I have given you la true. What does that mean? Freedom. You are now totally free. I have bought you out of the slave market. I have paid the price of Roman citizenship for you. And so far as I'm concerned, you're free to go any place in the Roman Empire and do whatever you want to do. I have paid the full price. Now, under those kind of circumstances, here are a couple kids fresh out of the barbarian nations up in northern Europe. They have never had it this good before. Here they've got a beautiful room in a beautiful home. They've got clothes like they've never had before. They're eating like they've never eaten before. And now this master says, you're free to go and do as you please. What do you suppose these kids would say? They'd say, master, I've never had it this good before. I'll be your slave. I'll be your servant for the rest of my life if I can just stay right here and serve you. Now, you see, isn't that exactly what God has done? 
See, God went into the slave market of sin. And even though, like I said in the last hour, it, it's a constant... It's a constant invitation. Now, I like to put it this way. All along this, this river of life, there's doorways of escape that we can get out of that slave market. We can let some benevolent individual, the Lord Jesus himself, we can let him buy us out of the slave market. But we have to agree to want to get out. He can't force us. Now, all along the riverbank, if I may continue to give that analogy, we've got these doorways, and I like to put it this way. Across the top of these doorways is a statement that says, Whosoever will may what? Whosoever will may come. Constantly. The redemption price has been paid, and all we have to do is take the way out. And then when we understand, as these two teenagers I used in my illustration, when we understand all that God has done for me, what should be our logical reaction? The same thing. Lord, I want to be your servant the rest of my life. After all, you've done all this for me. I've never had like this before. How many Christians do that? Precious, precious few. But see, this is again our whosoever will. Then, again, getting back to what we mentioned a week or two ago with regard to Calvinism and uh, as to whether or not we do have a choice, I like to put it this way, that on the front side of this doorway of escape out of the slave market is whosoever will may come. But after we walk through that door, we have chosen to take our freedom. If we could look back, then we would see that over the door on the back side is chosen since when? Before the foundation of the world. You know the rest. That says it all. I had a lady in my class who has been a missionary all her life. She retired now. And I gave that illustration. She came up afterward and she says, you know, I have never heard it put any better. Because, see, for a lot of people, it, it's, it's a problem when we point out the fact that, that God has chosen us. Long before the world was created, he knew that you and I tonight would be his. But we can't cancel out that whosoever. And so this, this just kind of covers it. From the front side, it's whosoever will may come. Nobody is left out. But when we decide to go through that door, we decide to stay with the Lord, and we decide to accept His remedy for our sin, then what can we see? Oh, He chose us before we were ever born. Now, do you just think about that? And, and the more you think about it, the more thrilling it becomes. All right, now let's go back to Genesis. And again, for anyone tuning in on television, in case you haven't heard us before, we started in Genesis 1, verse 1, and we're just going verse by verse. And even though at times we, we go back into the New Testament, we're going to little by little be making some headway up through the Bible. And if the Lord tarries, and seemingly uh, I'd have to say it won't be long, but if he does, why, we'll be making some headway going all the way up through the Old Testament and then on through the New. All right, so now if you're back in Genesis again, in chapter 4, after she realizes, and I imagine the Lord made it plain that Cain certainly was not the Redeemer as yet, although she had the right concept, this is the way the Redeemer would come. Then you see in verse 2, she has another child, and she calls his name Abel. Now, one of the first, I guess you can call it, rules of thumb in Scripture is that all the way through the Bible, you'll always have first the appearance of what we call the natural, and that is always followed then by the spiritual. Now, for example... Cain, as you well know, never became a spiritual individual, was he? He remained the natural, but he was born first. Abel was then the spiritual of the two, and he came second. 
you follow that all the way up through. You've got Esau, who was the unbeliever, and then you've got Jacob, the believer. First you've got King Saul, who was not a believer, and then you've got King David. And so all the way through, again, when we come now to the finalizing of God's program, first we're going to have the appearance of the Antichrist, the natural, and then the appearance of the true Christ, the spiritual. And so remember this, as you study your Bible, that it's always the natural and then the spiritual. So Cain is the natural, and Abel now is going to be the spiritual. All right, verse 2, reading on. Abel was a keeper of sheep, a shepherd. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. He evidently had no livestock. Now verse 3. And in the process of time. Now stop right there. The Hebrew indicates that what happened, that God had instructed this little family, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, he had instructed them on how to approach him. In other words, he didn't just send them out of the garden and let them fend for themselves. He still has their spiritual needs at heart. And so after the process of time or after a time of instruction, when he had made it so plain as to what they must do to gain fellowship with himself. And again, remember the premises that we've been holding up. There had to be a blood sacrifice, and it had to be accompanied with faith. Now, I'm always reviewing what's our definition of faith. Taking God at his word. All right, now let's look at these two young men. They are now young men. Now, you see, in Scripture, a punctuation, a comma, can flip you over many, many years. And so Cain and Abel are now young men. Cain is farming, raising things from the ground, and Abel is a herder of sheep. And so in the process of time, after they had been instructed, God had told them plainly what they must do, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. In other words, the things that he had worked for by the sweat of his brow whether he brought a bundle of grain or whether he put a, a bouquet of sorts together of various flowers and vegetables, we don't know. But it was definitely a sacrifice of things that he had raised from tilling the ground. All right? Now we've got to go on to the next verse. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings or the best of his flock, the fat thereof. And then again, that just meant the very best. Now, do you see those two different sacrifices? Cain's is a sacrifice that cannot shed blood. It is something that grew from the ground. Abel, on the other hand, brings the best of his flock, a blood sacrifice. All right, now let's drop down to verse 5, and then we're going to have to quickly go to the New Testament again. Verse 5, But unto Cain and to his offering, he that is God, the Lord, had no respect. He didn't accept it. And Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. Well, I, I skipped the last half, verse 4, I'm sorry, that when Abel brought the, the best of his flock, the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but Cain's he rejected. All right, now let's go back to Hebrews for just a moment. Go back to Hebrews... Chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Drop down to verse 4. Hebrews 11, verse 4. Everybody got it? All right. Hebrews 11, verse 4 says, By what? Faith. Now put the definition in there. By doing what? Taking God at his word. By taking God at his word, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And by that faith, not by his sacrifice, but by that faith, 
he obtained witness that he was now what? Righteous. Now, oh, that word righteous, too many people, I think they shrink from it because, oh, they think, you know, then I got to be holier than now and I got to walk around like I got some kind of a halo around my head. And no, that's not what the word righteous implies at all. Righteous just simply means that now we've been put on, an, on a footing with God that we can communicate with him. He has declared us righteous or right with himself. See? All right. So he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying. See, Abel didn't have to go back and brag, but God had now made it clear that Abel had made himself accepted with God, and by it being dead, yet speaketh, and even though sin had made its mark, yet by virtue of his faith and his obedience in sacrifice, Abel was right with God. All right, but now what about Cain? Come back to Genesis chapter 4. And I'm always amazed at how many people who have been in church all their life have never caught why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was not. I mean, I just have it come up constantly. All right? Verse 5 again, unto Cain and to his offering, God had no respect. And now, just like human beings today, see, the human race hasn't changed one bit. When people are shown from the Word of God that they're out in left field with whatever they may be practicing, what's their first reaction? Oh, they get mad. They get angry. It's no different. The first thing that struck Cain when God rejected his offering was what? Well, why not? And he got angry. See? All right? But you see, God is so gracious. God is so kind. He doesn't just zap Cain. Well, what does he do? He pleads with him. And so look at it now. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? You know what God is saying to Cain? Cain, if you would just listen to what I said and do that which I told you to do, I'd accept you. See, now here we boil down to a man of faith and a man destitute of faith. Abel remembered what God said to do to be accepted. What? Bring me a blood sacrifice and I'll accept you. Abel did it. Why? He believed God. Cain, on the other hand, and I always use the word rationalized. Cain rationalized. Here he's a farmer. He doesn't have a flock of sheep. And I think we're in here in Oklahoma, we can, we can picture very readily that maybe on the other side of the mountain was Abel with his sheep. And old Cain said, well, now, there's no reason I should make my way over the mountain and, and barter with my brother Abel for one of his sheep. Surely, if I do the best I can, if I put together the best beautiful sacrifice for God, surely he will accept it. That's rationalizing. That's not doing what God said, but that's rationalizing. Now think about it. Isn't that what the vast majority of people are doing today? Instead of coming into the book and seeing what God clearly says we have to believe, they rationalize and say, well, now look, if I do such and such, if I live in such and such a behavior pattern, surely God will accept me. Listen, God accept that person any more than he did Cain. It had to be God's way. And it had to be because that person believed that this is 